So yeah, we wanted this. Well, thanks for joining everyone. And uh, we, our intention was really to make this a, a conversation, an open conversation of all us uh, coming in from slightly different strands, um, open science, citizen science, citizen social science, and to explore what we are all doing and also to explore our uh, connectivities and how we can interact more, better, different, and, and uh, somehow learn from each other, not only today, but also uh, on the longer run. So that, uh, that's um, what the main intention is of this conversation. Uh, we have a few um, prepared <laughs> contributions, a few people from the community who will kick off um, telling a bit about uh, their, their work and then uh, it would be great to open up um, to questions, to further inputs from, from other people's work, um, so to make this a, a dynamic space. I will briefly yeah, introduce so we, um, who we have to, to start with, which is uh, Ana Sandres, who is um, from our um, GIGS co-act project and also Noob Lab in Honduras. And then we have Perry from um, the Hive Bio Lab, so Kumasi Hive in Ghana. We have, uh, is Kari actually here? Not sure, I don't see her in the list. From, from Senegal, maybe we will see if she will still join. Then we have Thomas from Boa Lab, so Cameroon and um, Oba from Will Square, Nigeria. So thank you everyone to share a bit about your work and then we will open up to have a have a conversation. Would you maybe, Anna, maybe want to start? Yes, I actually prepared a presentation, but it's super short, so no worries. Uh, just because we want to quickly share with you the COACT project in which uh, GIG is one partner implementing um, activities related to the communication, dissemination, the community building. So uh, it will be like five minutes. Let me share my screen really quick here. Can you see my screen? Yep, looking good. Okay. Do you still see only my screen, the presentation? Um, we see your presentation, but not in presentation mode. Okay, let me see. Here. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so, yes. So, I'm going to take the next five, six minutes just to um, give a very quick overview of the project COACT, Co-Designing Citizen Social Science for Collective Action in which, as I said, Geek is one of the nine partners implementing this project. So COACT is a three-year social research project that is proposing a new understanding of citizen social science. And we understand citizen social science as participatory research that is not only co-designed, but also directly driven by the citizens who are being affected or share the um, same social concern. In the case of COACT, we are proposing this new approach to face um, social global concerns and challenges, and specifically um, in uh, four issues and geographic scopes. So we have mental health care in Barcelona. And in there we're focusing on the life experience and self-perception of adult citizens with experience of mental health disorders uh, that are not placed at the center of the mental health care provision. Then we also have youth employment in Vienna and the challenge, the issue that we're focused on is that young people that are, mo that are, that are in most need of help and assistance um, do not use the youth coaching opportunities that they have in, in Austria. And therefore they don't find any place of training and education. We have a third one that is environmental justice in Buenos Aires, Argentina. We, the issue being that environmental justice um, in the country is not guaranteed. 
because inhabitants do not participate on the concrete, concrete definition of the problems nor on the social environmental risks. And the fourth one that we have is uh, gender equality, and that um, is in Europe. So we're going to um, have like three different research pilot projects in different uh, regions in Europe. So these uh, uh, actions that I just presented to you is what we call research and innovation actions in COACT. And an interesting question, what we find uh, very interesting about the project is, I mean, answers the question, how are we doing it? And within our r &I actions, on the one hand, we have groups of citizens that are facing or sharing a social concern, becoming core researchers in processes that are commonly dominated by academic researchers. Therefore, we recognize uh, citizens as in the field competent experts, as they are the ones who are experiencing and facing these issues. And on the other hand, we also involve universities, public administration, and other civil society organizations that are also working on the same topics. So the idea is to bring together these different uh, actors who are very relevant to actively participate in the research process. And this can go from the design to the collection of data, to the interpretation of the results, and even to the transformation into concrete actions. And these multi-stakeholder collaborations that I was uh, telling you about constitute what we call um, in COACT uh, knowledge coalitions. Uh, but um, most importantly, why are we doing it? So with these actions, we are bringing together and trying to further develop methods that give citizens, citizen groups an equal seat at the table, as uh, we say, through active participation in research. So in other words, citizens not only being beneficiaries or um, research subjects, but actually having an active uh, role in their own development. And one of the outcomes of COACT and our participatory process towards shaping this citizen social science approach is um, an open citizen social science toolkit, which would include a variety of uh, methods and tools that um, organizations that already exist or newly form, forming organizations can also use, test, test, experiment a bit to also tackle um, challenges in their communities. And um, just to be done and about this, finally, who is implementing COACT? So we are nine partners and you'll find universities, civil society organizations, also global networks from five different countries. So um, we have from Spain, Germany, Austria, United Kingdom, and also Argentina. And if you want to learn more about COACT, you are more than welcome to visit our website, www.coactproject.eu, and explore a bit more about the different um, actions. You can uh, explore this information in English, Spanish, German and also Catalan. But more importantly than that for us is that um, we're very much looking forward to connect with other communities uh, around the world that are also empowering citizens to play an active role in their own development. And we believe that these um, spaces uh, like this one that we're having now are the perfect space to have these conversations um, to just uh, connect and explore possible synergies and collaborations. Thank you, Anna. Great. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if we, if anyone has questions or if we do a bit of an intro of all the projects so we see the differences and, and, and then discuss. Uh, needless to say, probably that also within COACT, we are a mix of social scientists and, and, and hard scientists. And this is where the biggest discussions also emerge from since uh, as, uh, as social scientists, we ask different questions to, to issues. So it would be great to bring this up later. But yeah, maybe let's briefly um, showcase the, the other projects and then let's have a conversation. Uh, Harry, just for the sake that I have yours next on my list, would you like to briefly talk about the, the biolab? 
So I'm happy to, so I'm just sharing my screen. Yeah. I guess you can see my screen and you can hear me clearly. Okay, great. Um, so I'm actually presenting uh, our works that we have been doing uh, in the high bio lab uh, and uh, under the title developing molecular tests uh, in Africa using open source biotechnology and digital technology. And uh, my name is Harry Akligo. So as part of the presentation, I'm going to give a brief uh, profile uh, about myself, um, the research and projects that are spanning out of our um, DIY biohacking space and potentially giving a conclusion to uh, the presentation. Um, so just as a brief, my name is Harry. I currently uh, am with Kumasi Hive, where we co-founded the Hive Biolab as one of the nodes of the Open Bioeconomy Lab, which is based in the University of Cambridge. And uh, it largely started off as um, to, to actually fill a need of lack of access to reagents for doing molecular biology research and also potentially for diagnostics in, in our environment. So largely, we decided to leverage uh, open science, but with a focus on DIY biology and open source um, biotechnology. And what I like, what largely we mean by open source biotechnology is that um, we have currently patent documents that are uh, protecting innovations going to expiration. And for that reason, these uh, technologies are now becoming public domain knowledge and which we can harness. So that is what we have been harnessing for, for the past three years to develop tools and resources that can be used um, generally for biology research and also for diagnostics. But largely, how can we harness uh, the power of also digital technologies, digital fabrication to advance the work of, uh, uh, and, and also just advancing that maker culture, uh, largely in biology for community and public good. So um, currently in the high bio lab, uh, we are doing a research on how we can develop simpler molecular tests that uh, count in Africa. And just, uh, just to give a background to this particular research, uh, which is currently ongoing, we, we have very pre uh, prevalent in our environment uh, a number of blood-borne infections or infectious diseases ranging from um, malaria, gonorrhea, syphilis, I think most of which you may have heard of um, before. Unfortunately, the current diagnostic platforms for this are largely microscopy and it requires experts, uh, experts to be able to do this. And also we have seen even with the recent Ebola that, uh, sorry, with the recent uh, COVID-19 and also other just, uh, disease epidemics that we had on the continent happening because of the changes in these uh, disease causing organisms, right? But how are we able to overcome these challenges of diagnostics when we do not have diagnostics that can be deployed to community levels and can be easily accessible? And it becomes increasingly expensive. So, and most often than not, women and children are the most affected when we, they, they do not have access to this. So, how then do we develop sim simpler and affordable and easy to use tests that is, that is critical in the African continent or that is critical to the African context? It's for this reason why we are currently developing a multiplex uh, diagnostics, leveraging the open enzyme collection, collections or DNA polymerases that have gone uh, past their expiration stages leveraging these genetic parts that drive the development of or the production of this reagent locally, not having to rely on shipment from abroad. And I think we have made quite a, a tremendous um, efforts in, in getting our research further uh, down the, the line. And uh, so the question is how is open source biotech and, and open source biotechnology has proven to be uh, the new normal in creating sustainable tools and has a huge potential in molecular diagnostics. 
Uh, and that is one of the things that we are trying, currently trying to leverage and harness in, in our context. And I think um, this, this is just a schematic. It may look a little technical, but this is just a schematic showing uh, the current research uh, processes that are ongoing with regards to the enzyme production, where we are actively harnessing and um, these de genetic paths that are freely, access, uh, freely accessible through digital platforms on, on the internet. Um, so the researchers at Open by Economy Lab has been able to uh, build a whole digital repository of all these genetic parts that are freely available, uh, where you can just go in there, just like you have a bookshelf and you pick your books off these shelves. It's a similar approach that the Open by Economy Lab has done, and we have these genetic parts openly accessible. So we are leveraging these tools and putting it to good use in our community and using it to solve community problem because this is one of the things that we enjoy doing and we want to see uh, happen in our community. Uh, this is just demonstrating the multiplex uh, capability of what we are doing such that with the, the, at the end of the, this tool, what we are able to do is that we are able to uh, identify in a single reaction people who have multiple of this infection and it saves a lot of cost. And this is one of the things that we are trying, we are working hard at in our lab. And, uh, sorry, this, this is a picture of me uh, working very hard and, and seeing how we can. So this is just, uh, this is a picture of the Hive Bio Lab in, in Kumasi, at the Kumasi Hive where uh, I was working and testing some of the, the things I have just spoken to you about just to move that research forward. Um, and interestingly enough, and, and I want to mention this, uh, thankfully, we, we wouldn't have been able to move most of the work forward if not because of how we are leveraging um, the open source hardware community and also how other uh, community members like the Mbwa Lab have been able to build an open source uh, DIY incubator, which we're able to make use of that blueprint to also uh, build an incubator, which is one uh, piece of equipment very important for the work that we do. So uh, I personally think that this is one of the, the importance of how uh, digital fabrication, open science, and open science hardware is helping to move generally research uh, forward from a bottom-up approach in, in my context in Ghana. And I think this is something that can be also be replicated uh, on the endo continent. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Mbwa uh, would also speak to that regard. Uh, and I'm hopeful that at the end of this research, uh, we will see fully uh, a ready developed and simple and cost-effective molecular tool that counts in Africa. Um, one of the projects that we have equally done uh, was with regards to training scientists and students to get to that level where they understand Im this emerging technology and how they can harness this open science uh, approach to their research. So we brought scientists together from a number of universities in Ghana where we, we trained them in some, these emerging technologies uh, and also speaking to them about uh, what it needs to be open about their research and how it can go a long way to serving the community. This work wouldn't have been possible without the, the huge support coming from these amazing uh, people, the Open Bio Economy Lab, who I mentioned, the Chateau Foundation, Beneficial Bio, uh, Kumasi Hive, Ken Westin, and then Bola. And And I think this is where I will want to bring a docket uh, on my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Harry. Super interesting. And, and it's just such another dimension of uh, tangibility <laughs> than in the, in the social sciences. So we can, um, yeah, also maybe talk about the collaboration and the, the, the power dimensions between the different actors later, which is um, also quite different. But I would ask Thomas maybe to, briefly present the, the work of Mboa Lab. Okay, <clears throat> can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So I don't have uh, any slide to present. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for this opportunity. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm a researcher and uh, the founder of uh, the, the Mboa Lab. 
So uh, our approach of open science is uh, is uh, three uh, threefold, if I can say, is three dimension dimension of uh, openness. So the first dimension is uh, openness to uh, uh, publication and data. The second dimension is openness to society. And the third dimension is openness to excluded knowledge and epistemology. Uh, that is basically the last uh, definition uh, of open science released by uh, Leslie Chan from Aspiron for the UNESCO Global Com uh, Consultation on Open Science. So at the Mwana, the Mwana is almost framed uh, uh, like that also because we have three departments at the Mbwa Lab. The Mbwa Lab Biotech is the first department, uh, the Electromechanical and Artificial Intelligence Department, and the third one is uh, the Scholarly Communication Department. And you have transversal topics like open education and uh, uh, capacity building and citizen science as a transversal going across all these uh, departments. In terms of Mbwana uh, Biotech, uh, uh, so I don't have, I will not deeply go in because Mbwana uh, Biotech and uh, uh, by half uh, led by uh, Ari are uh, twins, if you want. So what Ari said is uh, basically what we are doing also at the Mbwana because we are collaborating a lot and some people of the Mwana went to buy have in Ghana to 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 to, to work with them for two or uh, during two or three weeks. So we are collaborating like that. Uh, the what we are doing specifically at, at the electromechanical uh, and artificial intelligence is to build device locally with equipment we have or local availability in such a way that we can break this gap uh, in terms of access of uh, a, a equipment and uh, in this way we are collaborating a lot with uh, university of bath and uh, stick lab in uh, in uh, in, uh, in tanzania and currently we are running a project related to digital medical uh, smart uh, device in uh, in Africa and uh, Ari also in Ghana if my half is also part of uh, this and one of uh, the, the 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 one of uh, the tools we are working on is uh, the open flexion uh, microscope uh, we are working on that actually but a part of that I I just received at the Mwana, we just received another grant uh, from the Open Society Foundation to work on uh, prototyping open, open devices for medical lab in, uh, in Africa. And um, that is why what we will do basically, uh, or my colleague Elise will do basically all uh, during the next year to do this uh, 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 research. And, most importantly, now when we are talking about open science, there is a lot of thing going around artificial intelligence. But our work in um, the Mwana as uh, uh, ethician and uh, social research scientist is mostly to work around uh, responsible uh, artificial intelligence to be sure that we are moving a lot of, or we are trying to uh, detect, identify and avoid biases related to uh, related to artificial intelligence. So that is uh, uh, what we are doing. So for example, what we are going to do uh, next uh, in January is to, because one of the big biases you have with artificial intelligence is about data. A lot of data we are using uh, data coming from uh, other contexts that we are using locally. So what we are going to do is to collect data in uh, related to malaria 
in Cameroon and see how we can build our own patent base in uh, our own patent related to anti antimicrobial uh, resistance. And uh, yes, basically that is uh, what we are doing. And also we are working a lot to strengthen local capacity of uh, student and uh, university uh, uh, because uh, they don't have the same uh, i don't know but they don't have the same approach of science like us so we have working with them to strengthen we used to host uh, some uh, uh, student at the at the lab and actually the one lab is a finalist of uh, the global the international uh, uh, competition innovate for health led by uh, organized by uh, the john hopkins university in the united states so the one of his finalists with some of those students we used to host as intern in uh, in cameroon so uh, yes i'm uh, very excited to <laughs> So I'm very proud of the Mbwana and I just defend my thesis and I'm going back from Canada to Cameroon because I feel like, uh, uh, I feel more comfortable in Cameroon and work from the Mbwana because I think open science can really have impact rather than stay here and teach at the university or something like that. So yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thomas. And indeed, congratulations well, to a lot of achievements and, uh, and news. At, but uh, yeah, most of all, your, your finished PhD. This is great. Congrats. Nice. Um, yeah, let's, uh, Oba, maybe if you want to share um, a bit about your work and then we, we open up the, dis uh, the, the conversation. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much for um, having this platform. Um, uh, we already <laughs> saw an extensive uh, uh, video on um, summary on what we do. Um, so I would just um, add to that um, so that we don't take time and just show some of um, the things which, uh, which we do in, at View Square. Um, our 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 core our core focus in terms of um, open science is to take um, just like Harry has said where um, you take an open science um, or open source uh, um, um, solution and find a contextualized um, application for it. Uh, most of the time for us in Nigeria, um, recently across Africa. Uh, and our key focus is to see how um, digital transformation can be achieved in all those different communities um, using open science tools and methodologies. Um, one of the uh, most successful ones so far for us is the Vault School, um, which um, has scaled across nine countries and um, has helped uh, over 7,000 kids um, learn effectively from the comforts of their home. So I'll just show one of, uh, I don't know if you can see this. So this is uh, pretty small, it's Pi Zero, right? And so something interesting which we did with it for the, um, for Volt School is to um, deploy the um, software which is more or less like an offline server on it. Um, um, something similar was done in Kenya by um, Hydrabox, um, which um, more or less is an offline server uh, on Pi 2 or Pi 3, but this is on Pi 0. And it can, we can simply deploy this in a learning boot in a um, rural area um, that has access to, um, that doesn't have access to internet. And students can easily learn you know, using this, like 30 students can connect via their different um, hubs, maybe a mobile phone or, um, or a computer or whatever digital device to this wirelessly because this just creates like a hotspot which they can connect to. 
Um, so that's really something interesting, which we are looking to deploy in Liberia. And um, we're going to deploy it in some of the rural areas that don't have access to internet in Liberia. Where with this, they can plug this into a radio station, for example, or even um, just have it within their community and students can all connect to it. Um, so something else which is really exciting, which um, we took, um, and as I said, the, the focus for us is applications. Um, uh, how can we take uh, most of these uh, uh, open uh, tools and see how we can channel them for, um, for um, dedicated purposes within Nigeria and even across uh, Africa. So another exciting thing is the, um, the vote microscope. Um, so um, what we've done basically is to um, transform um, and the open access um, um, public lab community microscope with their support. Um, they've really been so supportive um, in this project and basically um, to make it in a way that it's easy to use and um, it's, it's concise and easily just plugs into your computer and it, it, it takes it away from it being a kit and now being more of an off-the-shelf product. And why, why did we do this? Because we realized that most of the people who were reaching out to us during the lockdown, um, they were excited about um, the, 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 the community microscope kit, um, but they, want, they didn't want to assemble it. So they just wanted to take it out of the box and plug it in and use it. They didn't want to you know, put the whole thing together. And so uh, within our makerspace, some of our community members started assembling it for them. And then it got to a point where there were just so many people who wanted to assemble it. So um, we just said, okay, let's just assemble it and put it in the store and then people can have access to it and use it. We also like um, later on added like a manual for it. So where it's like um, well explanatory how to use it, um, you know, like different processes and different um, um, steps. Um, we also added something interesting to it, which is like a resource kit. So we have like a resource kit that comes with some base things. So we had, we realized that um, some of the people who are now reaching out to us were high school students um, who wanted to just have this and also have like some of the basic things that they could medically like um, pick liquid samples with or um, um, clean the lens with, you know, uh, or even have like, re like replacement bands and all those kind of things. So, or even have like, uh, we have like, like blank slides, you know, and all these different things. So what we did was um, basically to make this as um, a resource kit and everything in here is what everybody knows, right? We just put it together in, 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 a, in a transparent bag, you know, and throw it into the kit. And then we like box that up in a, in a nice, fanciful box and um when we, when we when we brought this out so many people were excited about it we had a lot of researchers from universities reach out to us and say um is it possible we, if we could get this and see how we can tie it into our curriculum and see where um people can begin to have personal lab wear um so because the labs were closed because of covid19 so they could easily take this home and use it um and has really turned out really very successful um, so far. Um, the, okay, so the link has been shared here already. So, so yeah, so basically those are the two really exciting things um, which we are working on. Um, we have um, also a couple of other tools which are uh, open access tools um, for, for educators and things like regarding checkers, you know, all those kind of soft um, software kind of tools which we have make accessible for um, university researchers. Um, something also exciting which, um, um, which um, personally I'm affiliated with is um, the Africa Archive um, platform, um, which has the goal to um, basically um, make access to research across the continent easy. Um, so uh, I think Joe, Joe can also like put the link to uh, the Africa Archive platform. And it's something really exciting because um, we over, over this, this past um, period of um, the COVID, um, we'll be able to see how 
people have engaged on the platform to share research which they're doing. But there was something really exciting which we, we realized it was that um, most, most researchers, because they had left their labs and they were at home and they didn't um, have access to all the advanced equipment and even most of them had their research on their office laptops or office computers. Um, they could not do research anymore. So we, we launched something called the audiovisual preprints. So what the audiovisual preprint is, is audio preprints where you can basically summarize all your research which you're doing in audio form. And then you can still upload it on the Africa Archive preprint platform where people can listen to, you know, they can listen to your, to your research in a more, uh, in a more compressed and summarized form such that you're still communicating your research while still under lockdown. Um, it was something exciting we saw because uh, we realized that most researchers um, now could pass more um, emotional connection with their research rather than just, you know, when you type um, text based. So you could actually feel the emotions of why they're doing this or what, you know, is driving them um, to do this research. So, so far, that's uh, something exciting. Uh, these are the things we've been working on. And um, yeah, thank you very much for the platform. And I would say um, thank you so much to um, Jogo. Um, Jogo has been um, amazing. Um, they um, supported us um, with micro grants for to to get the um, Bolt School platform up and running, and um, in addition to all the other resources which we receive from every other person, um, and I, 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 they've done such great work on the continent, and uh, we say thank you to them also. So yes, so that's it. That's a summary of everything. <laughs> thank you. Wow, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Actually, um, well, it's, it's just really great listening to all the stories and also seeing already in the chat, like how everyone is already collaborating and on what and what is used where by someone else. And because, yeah, our main question, like from, from COAG, kind of this whole citizen social science thing coming into this later, is like how to make great the synergies, how to collaborate also across this different kind of sections. Uh, let's say. So I'd say from our side, this is a big thing. We'd love to explore, like, how do these collaborations, like, grow and, and, and um, establish best across different contexts also, learning from each other, supporting each other through different, across different contexts. But um, yeah, I'd have a million questions, but I I'd want to throw the question out there, like, what you would prefer talking about um, with the main idea of, yeah, how can we work best together? across these different um, sections, let's say. Um, I'm just gonna help pull out questions that already came in from the chat. So I think Irene posted a question earlier. Do you wanna ask that now or bring in another topic? Here we have it. Okay, yes, I can. The Iran question is um, okay. The, the mythology rituals and uh, with today's science issue as well passes forward. So, thank you, Iran, for, for the question. So, the third dimension as I said before, of open science is openness to excluded knowledge and uh, epistemology. So the, the important thing is that uh, mythology and ritual are what we use to call contextualized contextualize, uh, knowledge. It, it means that as a, a scientist or people engage, engage in uh, open science, we need to take care about uh, uh, this kind of knowledge, where we are based and where we are working, or taking care about the mythology and the ritual we, of people we are working with. So that is part of uh, uh, the particip participatory methodology uh, Anna talked about uh, at the beginning. So the first thing is just to hear from uh, your environment, your direct environment, people, based in this environment and 
uh, try to build uh, uh, from their perspective, not to bring our own perspective as expert or something like that. So that is the first way to to open uh, the first way of openness. So understand and uh, build from uh, local perspective. And uh, uh, if we speak practically uh, in, in a practice, so I'm, I'm a Bantu from Cameroon and uh, the Mbwana is based in a village, you know, and in this village, people have their practice. So my, my tribe, we have our own practice and this kind of stuff. But before we did, we, we, we run some activities, like I have microbiologists in and uh, other stuff in and other and uh, molecular biologists in the lab. But when the time comes to do activities with people in the village or people around the lab, so it's not the same protocol they are using inside the lab that they are going to apply out to the lab or with citizen. The first thing they used to do, uh, I think Nadine is here, she can correct me, is always to, 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 to take the perspective of people around the lab and from there they can adapt or build together the protocol they are going to do. So that is what I want. I, I want to say, so the first thing is always move from uh, this local perspective and build from them, not the contrary. Thank you so much, Tamar. Um, Irene, do you want to add anything? Uh, hello, so my name is Irene. So, I think I some of you know that I'm Can you hear me? Yeah. It's a little bit hard to understand you, but we can hear you. Can we hear you now? Yes, thanks. Yeah, sure, thank you. Sorry, because we used speaker before. Uh, so what I want to ask, because I come from Yogyakarta and in Indonesia, and maybe like uh, we have like a... Uh, also a strong in tradition in mythology. So, and I come from Horn with work with art, science and technology from 1999. And uh, actually there are some difficulties when we, we uh, teach the society or the communities around us about the open science or open uh, hardware related to science because uh, uh, uh like we when we talk to the farmer about uh, when we make a photobioreactor for example and teach them about this photosynthesis process and uh, how we work with cyanobacteria and they don't get it but but this photo uh, kind of like representative of a goddess of fertility and a goddess of uh, a source of food and energy so they get it they get uh, they get it really well and they understand of the work of a bioreactor and for example when we work with with some microbe microbes and bacteria and we have to use this the semiotic, uh, semiotic way uh, to represent this scientific protocol into this other science. We call it the other science. For example, when we told them about uh, uh, transporting material, it's the same practice as, I think in Africa, it's like voodoo. So it's the same practice as voodoo, but it uses also infrared and uh, uh, ultrasound. So it's kind of like the same analogies. Uh, because when see science, sorry, with, I have to say, it's so Western perspective, but, and then how we, uh, 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 we put it in the, like, I think like in the global sort perspective, how science perceive actually. So, because we have that before, but they see, they see it as a tradition, they see it as a rituals, 
because when we do rituals actually and i found that this is actually a sound wave this is actually actually ultrasound and infrasound that can use in the farm but uh, they use it as a rituals they use it as a tradition uh, so i want to know like your perspective because it's not about technology but this about the other science that we already have and then yeah maybe Ricardo, you want to say a thing <laughs> yes uh first of all thank you very much uh thomas thank you very much and especially half for proposing this dialogue you know uh everybody knows about the diaspora african diaspora to brazil and when you go into traditional medicines or any other farms or traditional rituals to celebrate life no matter if you call it witchery or whatever you know uh you always have this <clears throat> constant walking together of science and livinghood you know so to take care of others to make rituals to make witchery to make medicine to make remedy it was part of your community so this when we try to do a citizen social science to bring people back to science maybe we are trying to get the academic science back to the real owners or the for the long lived owners you know uh, and Maybe it's quite important when you see in Thomas' presentation, uh, sorry, in Harry pre Harry's presentation, talking about open source and how can we deal now with open source? For example, now we are running for vaccines or things like this, you know, but uh, all, the, all the traditional medicine that existed in life was open source and was used by industry to make all this remedy, you know? So, the knowledge was captured privately and now it's a struggle to take it back to the public you know so i think maybe this is the interconnection of this social citizen science you know how to admit that science is social and have ever been you know it's we are just in trying to get I can't remember the name of this gear on your car when you go back. Back yeah. gear. <laughs> nice name. <laughs> you know, reverse. Thank you very much, Rosine. So, yes, that's it. You know, people are trying to reverse, but saying they are going forward. So, first of all, we have to make sure we are reversing. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you again, Thomas and Half Institute. Yes, I, I, I just want to add uh, a, a small comment to what Ricardo said. So, as a social scientist, uh, we need to ask uh, uh, to play our role is to be like a, a pace. I don't know if the a pacemaker, I don't know if uh, it's the, the, the right word, but we need to make a good connection between our own mythology and ritual with uh, the the Western knowledge we we, we got in uh, in school. So that is why that is the difficult task for uh, a lot of us as African to deal with so, social knowledge. If you take case like uh, a, a, a fermentation or this kind, that is a scientific process. Uh, so that our ancestors used to do a why, but. When you are dealing with uh, people in your local community, it's sometimes like you have you want to impose them what uh, you you learn in Western book. Why the same? They are doing the same thing and very well bef before uh, all this book you you, you you learn or all the knowledge you got from uh, um, this Western instruction. So we we need to do this. Uh, I, we used to call it. Um, uh, a kind of epistemological rupture. So to change your mind from your Western instruction you receive and try to understand what people locally are saying. So that is a, a very uh, big challenge for us as uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> as uh, a diaspora, if I can say, or as people instructed in the Western schools. 
Thanks so much, everyone. This is uh, going to a fantastic, uh, interesting direction. Actually, I feel like, so we talk a lot about this need for contextualization and all the discourses, uh, questions we have to ask around that. Um, and I feel like, like now from the citizen social science um, side or perspective that we are trying to build and speaking as a social scientist, it somehow all comes back to the question of uh, how do we define participation and, and the, the kind of concept of participation that is actually not grown in Western context, but in Latin American, African context, which uh, we try to bring up in the beginning of, of COACT a bit. And it would be super great to, yeah, to, to hear other people's uh, opinions about this um, reflection or how open the reflection about what we mean with participation actually in terms of completely blanking off any predefined concepts and so on when we step into such a um, co-creative processes. So this in, in COAG this was a, a big discussion and struggle and I think still is and also kind of a, a thing that is hard to tap into or people try to don't really connect with because it's not an easy one, but I'd love to hear from you guys, um, yeah, how you work with this conceptualization of participation and, and apply it. I know there's also so many people who have not yet spoken. Sorry, I just wanted to say like, um, I know there are so many other open science experts in the room as well, like Alex or Ara, if you want to say something on this topic, please feel free to chime in. Sorry, Tomar, I didn't want to cut you off though. If no one, if no one wants to go, so I was talking about Ari or Goba, so feel free to, to talk also. But what I can say is that in terms of participation, from my perspective, we need to differentiate level of participation. Participation in international collaboration, like uh, me as a MOA lab and uh, geeks or, or Open by Economy Lab is different of participation in uh, in, in a grass at, at uh, a local level, for example, in Cameroon with my community. So the, 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 the first dimension in terms of international collaboration, so, and uh, this is something very bad, is uh, the, the collaboration in terms of uh, just a false representativity. So you have a lot of projects where uh, people um, bring or invite you as uh, a collaborator from Global South just for a false representativity. So you don't have access to the the, the, the real uh, uh, knowledge through this project, you know, it's like a kind, it's like a, a black box, you know, but a real and a fair collaboration need you uh, to have this kind of, uh, kind of, to allow people or your collaborator in the Global South to be able to open this black box, you know, and that is why um, uh, the, the collaboration with uh, 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 open by economy lab is so important for us. So at, at a local level, I maybe I will I I want Oba maybe you can say something because you have a very good experience working with uh, Terry Yuju some uh, in uh, in um, in Nigeria. So if you want, maybe you can share something. This is a very sensitive topic. <laughs> so, um, I, 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 I would, I'd, I think that when we look at um, collaboration on the local scale, um, we think more about the communities that we work with first. And, um, so there, I know there are some times that you, you, it's more or less like it's a black box. You don't know what's going on. You're more or less like just plugging into this black box and you get responses and it's a miracle. You don't know how it's happening, but you get those responses. Um, but for us, we, we try to work with the communities and really look at what problem this is trying to solve. And if it is a black box, to be sincere, you plug it in like a black box and try and use it in, as a building block to build you know, the next um, um, innovation for that community. The end goal is impact for the community. For us, that's what we see. 
its impact for the community. And whatever it takes to get impact for the community will do that. If, um, if we're either elevating poverty in that community, if we're um, providing access to education within our community, we take the, in, in this, in the collaboration space, take what is available for us, even though it's a black box and we don't really understand what's going on with it and try and plug it into um, a bigger solution. So I'll use the, um, um, the microscope as an example. Um, when we took the microscope, um, it was something that was working, right? Um, but then we got a lot of feedback from people. So the initial microscope says, oh, how can we measure, um, how can we do measurement of samples with this microscope? The initial one we had didn't, didn't have any you know, conversation about that. This is, for instance, you put a liquid sample, this is it on the, on the computer screen, end of story, right? But how do you measure the distance between um, the, the length of, of a cell, you know, or how do you do that? So um, at that point, we had to now go back to the drawing board to more or less like build on it and create a whole software image recognition system that could do that where you can just draw a line from one point to the end point and it just gives you the distance. And so that's an example for us. So the end goal is the community. This is what we need to do for the community. We have this black box. We need to add some other, you know, components to it to make it work. Um, we also need to, you know, um, uh, do more advocacy um, for um, um, the, the, the ethics in open science and um, see how people can, you know, uh, properly document their, their research or you know, whatever tools or, um, or, or hardware or products which they do um, in that way. Um, but from, for us, we look at it from the community angle. We look at it from the community angle. I just add one thing to that point, Hoba. Uh, it, sorry, I just add one thing to that point is we have always to remember that we've come from oral traditional communities, you know, just like Thomas said, when you go outside the lab, the world is different and the, the world is oral. And how can we bring this oral tradition that is so strong in many of our countries to be, to be part of this documentation process? We already have the media for that, you know, we have the means, we have the tools, we just don't have the protocols, you know, to make it like, reasonable knowledge, the oral tradition, how can we in bring this together, you know, like, what are we sharing here? We are sharing oral tradition, uh, you know, how do we emphasize that? And yeah, thank you. Thank you so um, much, Ricardo. I, I felt like there were, Alex, I think you wanted to say something before, no? No? It seems like, <laughs> but maybe we can, we have so many great project, people from great projects here, maybe we, uh, it would be great to, yeah, to hear some more examples on, yeah, how you engage locally uh, and yeah, this uh, unpacking this part contextual participation a bit more from different kind of examples. Um, hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, hey. Okay, I'm Nadine from Cameroon. I'm part of the Mboa Lab team and uh, one of the nodes of the Open Bioeconomy Lab. So just to add a little bit to what um, Harry, Oba and uh, Thomas have said about um, including the community in um, the works that we do, especially making science more accessible to the communities. So what we do is we make the population or the uh, community understand or uh, yes understand that their ideas or their concepts and methods are also very relevant taking the example of the process of fermentation like um, thomas uh, quoted before because we were able to build this incubator which we later um, transformed or had another version of it as um, a cosamto which 
is or uh, applied in the manufacture of uh, milk or yogurt locally. So what we do is in one of our workshops, we'll have to invite the community members. We find out from them how they produce yogurt. So they have their methods which they use that are so traditional, yet it also use as good yogurt as uh, we can literally call it. So when they expose or tell us how they do yogurt, we accept, we tell them, yes, this is fine. The yogurt you have is uh, serving its purpose. People can consume it. Then now we bring in the western or the, the, the method of fermentation proper like we learned in school. But then breaking it down in very simple ways and comparing the two methods so that they themselves are able to see the, the, the slight differences in the methods and also the adjustments that we are bringing in. So it's very easy then for them to easily accept that, okay, this is how we were doing, but well, we will accept to do it this way so that it should yield better. And as the approach we are using just to make um, science very inclusive and make the population easily accept the, the Western way of science or the Western approach of things. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nadine. Uh, Ada, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just a quick yeah. one. I was going to say that uh, co-creation, I think it's, it's the bottom line to uh, having a more participatory and a more communal approach to uh, getting the community more, more involved in solutions that we create for them on a daily basis, right? Uh, I mean, right from uh, biology, I mean, we have been having, uh, we've been hearing buzzwords like community biotechnology, DIY biology, participatory biotechnology. All this is trying to uh, mean that solutions that are developed are co-created together with the end users in mind. How do you engage them uh, at every point of the way? So for me, what I, I think at this point is co-creation is, is that, uh, the level entry where to engage and, and, and uh, have a more participatory approach to uh, a more inclusive way of developing solutions for people. And I think it is, it is exactly the same thing that the COACT project is uh, trying to do. How can you leverage uh, people who you are developing solutions for? And uh, I think that way you are not going to build a solution where when you take it back to them, they feel so distant away from, from it. And, and I think this has been evident in a number of projects, even uh, ones which we have done here in uh, at uh, the Hive Biolab and generally Kumasi Hive uh, ecosystem, uh, where we most often try and have a service engaging the people we want to build solutions for, uh, have them on board while we are de developing these solutions and uh, finally take it back to them and in that iterative process before it finally gets to something they begin to use. So I think that that is one of the ways we, we can begin to have more inclusive participation to some of these things we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, it's the, the best co-creation is, a, um, I mean, we're dealing with the, the term a lot also in, in co-act, and I think the, the risk is always to, it, to not use it in an inflationary, do you say it like that, um, way. But uh, being critical about, okay, if co-creation, where does it start, where does it end, and who poses the question to co-create or the issue to co-create to start with in this? So for us, it was, would be super wonderful to continue a conversation with you guys on these topics because there are so many good practices out there that do this very consequently, where we'd love uh, or we can learn a lot from, I think, as the, the whole citizen social science approach grows. However, Ada, you wanted to say something and I didn't want to cut this off. Thank you. I think it's already time out. And uh, so, yeah, maybe I can tell one of the, the, the practice that we follow, we, we, we follow challenge-based uh, learning. So we don't actually uh, wait for people to come to us and start something. 
uh, we actually go to those uh, epicenter of the problem, we find the first circle of the victims. So the people who have been really affected by the problem and we try to, uh, usually they don't want, and then we, we try to bring them in another way that you just come and come for a talk. And then, then we, we go through the, the kind of a coaching session to identify, okay, you see, you have been the first hand victim of, of this issue. And then why don't you try to like, you know, uh, solve that issue in that way, it is more like, you know, the, the best solutions come from the people who have been, the, ha, who had the problem. So that's how we do the bottom up approach. The second thing as I was a child in Sri Lanka. So once we had a, a, a cage with a, a parrot and one day we decided to open the, the cage and the, but the, the parrot was happy and, and was getting the food. What this, this parrot did, it went and brought other parrots. <laughs> So exactly the birds of feathers, right? You know, when we identify that center of the victim and that victim goes and find related relevant people and these people are more driven to solve the problem than some external people trying to solve the problem. And to also answer a little bit of uh, uh, this um, mythology and thing like coming from a Tamil background, we have like, uh, uh, is one of the classical language, you know, even what we read is like 3000, plus years old uh, literature in our school in Tamil. And uh, um, uh, even if you look at Buddhism and several religious scriptures, they talk about a lot of things which are basically science. The Veda itself is science. It's not something different, but they have to tell a story around that science so, so the people can engage. So we used to have a certain group of discussions that where we have like kind of a uh, you know, part of a peace building and reconciliation work. We have all people from different religion. And then we have like technologies and someone presents uh, a, a religious concept and we try to find a scientific uh, affiliation or a concept or theory on that. One time we were, um, uh, one religious leader was saying that you need to go to the temple uh, so that you get all the good energy from the center of the temple. And then I asked, okay, what if, if I go to the temple, it's surrounded by full of lot of negative uh, thought people who want to have some materialistic thing, how will that positive energy will come? And he said in a religious way that the, the good energy, the, the wishes, they always follow the hearts which are not closed. That means they are, they are open to, to try, you know, travels. So in electrical engineering, it's called uh, trans, um, it's called waveguide. So it's a simple theory. It says that uh, the energy tra you know travels in a more uh, least resistive path. So charged particle will travel in a re least resistive path. So if your heart is closed, is opposite of you know it's conductive and resistiveness, and this is how the energy from the center. If you look at uh, even the lightning that will always bend around uh, the conductive path to reach the ground. So even if I'm in a temple with surrounded by a lot of non-conductive things, it will always come to me. And, and this is the way that we always try to relate uh, to two parts of the science and, and ancient science, so to say it's, uh, it's mythology, but it's ancient science. It's a few points from me. Oh, yeah. This is so wonderful. I, I, I could just keep listening. This is, thank you so much for, for sharing this. And I hope we can, we can yeah, keep this, uh, this conversation going. Unfortunately, we cannot do this now. So I will hand over to Geraldine for a moment. Thanks. I also, I want to say something before we close and we have to close in a couple of minutes because I'm getting the rest of the team messaging me. It's the party time now. Where are you all? So, um, which I'm of course going to invite you all to join. Before we close the session, like I said, I wanted to give a couple of ideas of how we could continue, but I also wanted to welcome Kari. Um, thank you so much for joining the conversation. If there's anything you'd like to share before we close about your work or the topics we've just been talking about, please feel free. Hello everyone. I'm um, sorry for joining up late. So I actually I think we had an issue probably with um, time because I thought it was 5 p.m. Um, Greenwich time. So but anyway, so I guess um, I missed part of the conversation. But I, what I wanted to say is just like for the for the work I do, just a bit quick. It's just about like promoting uh, STEAM education and doing it in a way that's culturally relevant. 
and then um, and then for that, I heard like some people talk about how you get communities involved, and in this case, I mean, I guess what people have said is actually at some point it's just to make sure like they include it in whatever uh, pro like project or something you're trying to do. So, and I guess, I mean, you guys have been talking for like an hour or so, so um, I don't want to take much of your time. So, but I guess we'll have the occasion so I could talk more about, um, you know, like the work and then, um, you know, some other projects I'm involved in. So, but definitely thank you all and hopefully we'll have uh, other occasions to meet again. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining the conversation, Kadi, and I'm really sorry if there was any mishap uh, in time zones. Um, obviously, your work relates so deeply to the conversation that we've been having here. And as Cassie said, it would be really great to find out different ways to continue the sharing process. So we wanted to have this mm -hmm. conversation today basically to kick things off. And I just wanted to share a couple of ideas with you before we leave. The COBE Act project mm -hmm. is going to be running for another two years. And during these two years, we're going to be collecting and exploring different methodologies and seeing, as we said earlier, how to connect and tie into different open science communities. We're also starting a new small but great project that we, um, the idea was birthed at DOTS last year in Nakuru. Um, uh, Ville Square is going to be spearheading on collecting different ideas about um, open science and peacekeeping in an open document. And I'd like to invite you all to contribute to this. If you're interested in this, you can reach out to Oba or myself or Anna and Kasti also, and we can continue the conversation. If you're okay with it, I would also send a follow-up email to the session to everybody who joined in on this topic. And lastly, we basically wanted to see if people are interested in, yeah, continuing the conversation. So maybe opening a chat group within, um, as like we have a chat group for other topics as well within the gig group, like the Caribou's chat group, which is a really lovely place for exchange on different topics like this. But we're also open to joining other groups that you might have if you say, no, this already exists. Um, let's not duplicate, let's join here. Then we're really open for your suggestions. And yeah, uh, obviously we'd love some feedback on this, but I realized we totally overstepped the time that we had available for the session. So um, if you want, give us a quick um, notice by email or whatever communication channel, if you want to be up for this and otherwise I'll just be following up or we'll be following up with you um, through an email after the session and see if you're interested in joining or if you have ideas where to join. Great. Thanks a lot, Geraldine. Thanks everyone so much. Yeah, as Geraldine just said, like we would be super interested to, to have a chat group or something like a faster kind of way of staying in touch uh, than through emails uh, for the future as we would co grow and as we, yeah, m merge or try to merge into gig and, and all the, the, the great uh, discourse and, and happenings um, taking place in the community. So yeah. Uh, thanks everyone. It was so great to see so many people joining and really hope uh, not in the too far future we can all meet in, in person again and have uh, keep uh, this, this conversation going. That would be really, really wonderful. Thank you.